contracted cancer. And she was in the hospital there in Fort Valley. And Ed said that he, Coach Rock, would allow him during his senior year to make many trips from Lexington down to Fort Valley. And he spent many times there by her bedside. And he told of the immense pressure he was under as they were playing on a championship ball club. And his wife, whom he had recently married, was dying with cancer. Subsequently, she died. And I remember when I was preaching there in Fort Valley, I told the Jolos, I said, Brother Joe, one thing I want to do while I'm here in Fort Valley, I want you to take me out to the cemetery. I remember when Ed gave his testimony and told about Billy's death, a beautiful, sanctified, spirit, Christian lady, a registered nurse. Brother Ed said her one desire was to reach out with the healing grace of Jesus and help people. And I said, Brother Joe, I want you to take me out one afternoon to the cemetery here in, here in Fort Valley. And I, I want to go out and I want to see Billy Beck's grave. Joe recounted to me many of the facts that I've shared with you right now. And we drove out to the cemetery and I stood there. I saw the name of Billy Beck. If I'm not mistaken, she was only about 20 or 21 years of age. And as I stood there looking at Billy's tombstone, I remember something that Ed said in his message that Sunday night in my dad's church. He said that he was by his wife's side. And he said the curtain was about to come down. She had grown very, very weak. Ed had flown down from Lexington. If I'm not mistaken, it was right before the NCAA tournament. Brother Ed said that he was next to her hospital, and next to her bed in the hospital. It was the night she died. In that testimony, Ed told of how he fell down on his knees by the bed, and he prayed for Billy's healing. And Ed said an interesting thing. He said, when I prayed for my wife's one of the last things she said to me, she looked at me and took my hand. And keep in mind, this beautiful, sanctified, spirit-filled Christian lady, right in the youth of her life, Ed Beck said that she looked at me. She said, Ed, right now, don't pray for my healing, but I want you to pray for my own. That's what I'm going to talk about for just a few moments this afternoon. Understanding divine healing. Now I know that when we talk about divine healing, we are dealing with a subject that is very complicated. Not only is it complicated, it is also very controversial. And the reason it's controversial is because it has been religiously exploited and theologically twisted. And yet healing is an important part of our faith as Christians today. Healing was a very important part of our Lord's ministry. Now following his temptations in the wilderness, as our Lord prepared to commence his earthly ministry, he stood in the temple and he read from the book of Isaiah and he predicated his ministry upon several charges and among them in Luke chapter 4 verse 18 notice what Jesus said. God has sent me to preach the gospel, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Notice what else our Lord said. To heal the broken party. And all throughout the book of Luke, and in the other three gospels, we see the ministry of healing. It continues throughout the book of Acts. And the church of today is to have a healing ministry so I was looking in the book of worship of my particular denomination, and there is an entire section entitled Healing Services and Healing Prayers. I also, Brother Dave, noticed in our United Methodist Hymnal, there is an entire collection of hymns under the heading Healing. Now, how do you preach a sermon on the subject of divine healing? or understanding divine healing. Dr. Arnold Prayer was a great Methodist minister from Missouri. He wrote a book on the subject of healing. 
And he entitled that book, How Much Faith Does It Take? In this book, Dr. Prater says, the next time you hear a little bird singing, remember that little bird is not singing because it has all the answers. It's singing because it has a song. For the soul is always more important than the answers. And Dr. Prater continues, and if you don't have a soul in your heart, the answers would only raise more questions. So in this sermon this afternoon, I do not claim to have all the answers. I'm not sure I've got any of the answers. And this message this afternoon is simply a part of my song that I wish to share with you. Now in this message, what I want to do is we think about the subject of divine healing. I want to divide our thinking into three areas. Number one, I want to talk about the places where we need healing. Number two, I want to talk about the misconceptions about divine healing, or perhaps a better word would, would be the myths of divine healing. And then number three, I want to talk about the means by which God brings divine healing. All right, number one, the places where we need healing. Now, there are many areas where we need to experience the touch of the great physician. There are many areas in life where, as Brother Dave sang, the healer longs to touch us. Number one, we need God's healing with our attitudes. Chuck Swindoll said, your attitude is the most important thing you have going for you. I agree with Dr. Swindoll because who you are today is a reflection of your attitude. And we're living in a world today, sad to say, even in the church, are many people who have negative attitudes, and these negative attitudes have made them into negative people. Montaigne and I have a friend at our annual conference. We graduated from seminary together. We served churches right close to each other. I'll tell you, if anybody needs healing with his attitude, it is this dear brother. They, he has moved just about every year over the last 35 years. My thing knows exactly what I'm talking about. He, he did manage to stay in one church for two years. And it's interesting, when you talk to him in an angel cup, right, he will always tell you the problems in the churches he served. And I found out real soon that brother he needs for his attitude to be filled. And so number one, and I, I'm going to rush through these very quickly, we need to let God heal our negative attitudes. Number two, we need healing with our devotions. For several years, Dr. David Simmons was the pastor of the First Methodist Church in Wilbur, the church that Brother David served. He also taught at Asbury Theological Seminary. Dr. Siemens wrote a wonderful book entitled The Healing of Damaged Emotions. Now remember when we were in Mobile, we had him for a healing of damaged emotions weekend. It was one of the most meaningful times in the life of my ministry. Brother Siemens and I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time together over that weekend as he was in our church. He ate his meals in our home. And during that weekend, I remember David saying to me, how would you listen to George, you would be amazed at the number of people who have emotional scars. And those scars, quite often, more than not, go back to childhood or adolescence or even college. And many of the people have never told anybody about that hurt. And he made this very arresting statement, this brilliant man. He said, most of them, not many of them, most of them have never found healing of any kind for those damaged emotions. And I've got a feeling there are some people listening to these words today and you bear emotional scars. And you've never experienced the healing touch of the great physician. Yes, we need to let it heal, number one, our attitudes. We need to let it heal our emotions. And then number three, we need to let him heal our relationships. You don't live long until you discover it's so easy for relationships to become tattered and torn and frayed and even broken. 
He probably 